All right, now we're going to look at women in comics. And as I said, that means that uh, we're both going to look at female characters and female creators. And we're going to start by looking at female characters in the Golden Age, some of which we've already done when we discussed the Golden Age. Now, right here, we have probably the three most famous female superheroes from the Golden Age period. You got Wonder Woman, Black Canary, who wasn't really all that famous at the time, but I have her here because she is now the most well-known, one of the most well-known, because she's uh, she became much uh, more well-known later. And Phantom Lady, uh, originally from Quality Comics, and as we saw, took a very long, circuitous route to eventually get to DC by the 1970s. Well, these are the three main ones, and we've talked a bit about all three of them. We're going to look at some others in a moment. But first, let's talk about sort of the uh, general trajectory of women superheroes, or superheroines, as they were sometimes called. I, th I like women superheroes, or female superheroes, better myself. All right, well, Wonder Woman, as we know, as written by William Moulton Marston, uh, or Charles Moulton, was was a strong, powerful female figure who was uh, meant to be a role model for empowerment for girls. And as you can see, here she is uh, scooping up boyfriend Steve Trevor and rescuing him, which was a common sight during the Marston years, which was 1941 to 1947 when he died. And uh, here on the right, uh, here's uh, the cover of an issue from 1946 where she's teaching a little girl to play baseball, which, you know, at the time would have stereotypically been considered a boy's game, right? There was a whole uh, Tom Hanks and Madonna movie about that. Anyway, um, this is the sort of the pattern that other female superheroes would follow during the first half of the 1940s, during the first half of the Golden Age. In fact, there's some, there's some weird ironies at work here. There were, there were so many female superheroes. There were anywhere uh, from at least 125 to uh, 150 or more. And we're talking about uh, female characters that, uh, well, in some cases appeared with other people or as part of a team, but for the most part, either had their own titles or at least their own, their own features in anthology, anthology books. So uh, a lot of them were like Wonder Woman. They were very strong. They were empowering, most of them were not sort of the sidekick of some male superhero or male character. And as we will see, Wonder Woman, uh, in some ways, uh, maybe historians have been giving William Moulton Marston a little too much credit because there were several other similar characters uh, that showed up before, but none of them had been at DC or All-American. Uh, so that, that much is definitely true. However, as we saw, after Moulton, uh, William Moulton Marston was no longer on the scene and the, uh, the writing fell to specifically Robert Conagher in that case, then Wonder Woman's whole approach kind of changed. Uh, this is uh, an image of um, uh, an issue from October 1949 and as you can see uh, it's sort of like the opposite of the earlier one we saw here Steve Trevor is carrying her and if you look at the backup features they're all about romance and as we discussed earlier essentially what happened was that uh, that Wonder Woman uh, in her own comic became kind of obsessed with, oh, who am I going to marry? When will I get married? What can I do to help him? Sort of stuff. 
rather than the very strong, empowered, independent figure that she was the first several years, except when she was written by Gardner Fox over in, you know, The Adventures of the Justice Society, where he summarily made her the secretary and made her stay behind on all the adventures and stuff. But that was uh, um, that was his take. It wasn't Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman's creators or co-creators' take. Well, in some ways, in some ways, that whole trajectory is kind of um, emblematic, emblematic of what was happening with other female super uh, superheroes or female characters in general um, as the uh, decade progressed. Uh, and it was also sort of emblematic of what was happening in real life. I remember uh, Wonder Woman appeared 1941, which was right before the U.S. entered World War II, but when a lot of people in the U.S. were thinking there was a really good possibility that, uh, you know, we were going to enter World War II. And then the subsequent years were mostly uh, mostly war years. And during that time, we saw a lot of imagery that was uh, being promoted by the federal government that was encouraging the self-empowerment of women so that they could uh, do their part for the war effort, which everyone was expected to contribute to. And since large numbers of young men were in the armed forces, large numbers overseas fighting, uh, that means that they weren't at home doing their jobs, many of which were necessary for the war effort. So a lot of women were encouraged, actually, to, to leave the home and go out into the workplace. Very similar to what had happened in World War I, except on a much larger scale, because the, uh, the home front investment in the war was much bigger because the involvement in the war was actually uh, much bigger than in World War I. So women are being encouraged to go out and, and do the jobs previously done by men and being um, sort of affirmed that they can do it. They can do a man's job. And that was all well and good while the men were away. But then what happened, of course, the men came home after the war ended and wanted their jobs back. So these same women who had been encouraged to do their part by going out and and getting involved in the workforce were now uh, sort of seen as threatening to men on, on a couple of different levels. Uh, on uh, a literal, uh, well, maybe not literal, but on a financial, on a financial level, because the men want these jobs. That's their jobs, right? Uh, and also on an existential level, because uh, the woman's role in Western society had been clearly defined for centuries. Um, it hadn't been that many centuries ago, that, uh, by which I mean one and a half, since women were considered basically chattel and property. Uh, so now these women need to get out of the workforce and get back in the kitchen where they belong, essentially, was how... A lot of the men looked at it, and who who was in charge of society? The men who was in charge, who was in charge at advertising agencies, men. So, this domestic goddess um, trope became very, very, very common, and it was pushed really hard by ads in print, and on the radio, and later on television. Uh, be the perfect housewife. If you're a woman, that's your job. That's your only job, other than being a wife and mother. Notice here on the right, this ad, life can be beautiful. Well, who's it beautiful for, right? Here, the, the guy here who's being served basically hand and foot. And just to reinforce this, uh, some of the ads got uh, got very kind of in your face as the 1950s went on. You've probably seen some of these before with the woman down on her knees 
serving the man breakfast in bed. And because it's the 1950s, he not only has a fresh haircut, but he uh, apparently slept in his necktie. Uh, and the one in the middle, that one is uh, <clears throat> really disturbing uh, and infamous. If your husband ever finds out you're not store testing for fresher coffee, well, look what's going to happen. <laughs> your husband beats you. And then on the right, um, this looks like it might be in the 1960s, advertising this, uh, this kitchen implement called the Chef that slices and dices and uh, mixes and etc. The Chef does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. And so that message was, uh, was being put out there very, very clearly in popular culture, in the media, which again, controlled by men trying to rein in these women who had had too strong a taste of independence during the war years. And, you know, it's, it's coincidental that uh, Marston happened to die in 1947, if he had lived another 10 years, one wonders how much pressure would have been brought to bear on him to soften up Wonder Woman and make her more sort of the, uh, the expression of what, what corporate ownership deemed femininity to be. And how hard he would have resisted, I would imagine he would have resisted it completely. He probably would have quit if it came down to it. But he's off the scene, just as this is starting to happen in the uh, wider wider picture. And that's reflected in how female superheroes are portrayed. Now, at the time this is happening, superheroes are kind of going, they're, they're sliding in popularity, and they're on their way out. But they won't be out for too long. As we saw, by the late 50s, they're starting to make a comeback, and they made a big comeback in the 60s. But what's interesting is that the golden age women superheroes not only existed in much greater numbers than women superheroes did in the 60s or even 70s, but they were more empowered and stronger, stronger women. I don't mean just mean I don't just mean physically stronger, but I mean so far as carrying the weight of the narrative of the book, for many of whom it was their own book, then, then later it would be arguably the 21st century before uh, women superheroes in, in the industry would catch up. And I, I would say they really still haven't. They still haven't. Female characters in the year 2020, uh, in, in some ways, are are less less empowered the superhero characters and the other characters as well the other female characters as well than than they were in the 1940s during World War II and that's a very interesting commentary and it also happens to be pretty sad. Also sad these images of women in the comics from the 1950s. The less said about them, the better. But I wanted to show them just so, you know, you get the full weight of what we're talking about. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's go back now and look at some of those female superheroes from the Golden Age. Now, as I said, some of them were sidekicks to male heroes or female versions of male heroes, but a surprisingly small percentage um, there may be a couple of more instances beyond what I have here, but, uh, but not many. So, Hawkman and Hawkgirl, we've talked about. Uh, Captain, Captain Marvel's sister, Mary Marvel, we've talked about. Also, Rocket Man had Rocket Girl. Bullet Man had Bullet Girl. Lightning Lad had Lightning Girl. And over at uh, Timely, the Patriot had Miss Patriot. Uh, there she is in all her, uh, all her glory in uh, um, Bound, about to be branded. Uh, and <clears throat> Timely also had Namora, who was the, the cousin, the female cousin of Namor the Submariner. Now, 
she's kind of almost a different uh, um, different story because she's not necessarily Namor's sidekick. Uh, most of her adventures are solo adventures, but that doesn't change the fact she is essentially a female version of Prince Namor. Well, also at Timely there were there were several others. Uh, several female superheroes. There was the Silver Scorpion, who was neither silver nor a scorpion. There was the Blonde Phantom, Miss America, that we've talked about. Um, there is Namora uh, over on the right hand, uh, lower right, and on the upper right, the Black Widow, alias Clairvoyant. We've talked about her before. We haven't talked about Venus. Uh, Venus is the actual Greek god. And this started in 1948. And it's kind of an interesting title. 48 is when the romance titles uh, were really taking off. So here, Marvel was able to, kind of like um, DC had done with Wonder Woman, they're kind of able to take that mythological Greek motif and make a superhero out of it. But they're also able to make it a romance comic at the same time. Miss Fury you'll notice. Uh, for the publisher, I have both Timely and Street and Smith. That's because Miss Fury was initially a comic strip uh, by uh, Street and Smith, created by Tarpe Mills, who was a female artist. She was the writer and the artist of that strip, um, making Miss Fury the first... Uh, the first female superhero to be created, written, and drawn by a woman. And Timely uh, had a Miss Fury title that reprinted all the old comic strips and later had some new material. Then Miss Fury kind of shifted around from company to company. Now, moving forward a little bit, um, although still tangential to the 1950s, in 2006, Marvel put out uh, a title called Agents of Atlas. And these guys had appeared briefly in, uh, in an Avengers story a few years before. It's basically the idea that all of Atlas Comics, not all of them, but several of Atlas Comics characters from the late 40s and early 50s had been on a team in the 50s. They really weren't. Uh, what am I saying really? We're talking about comic books. But not during the 1950s uh, comics. But retroactively, they were they were on a team, and that uh, that team was led by Agent Jimmy Woo. And if you'll notice there, on the right, on the far right, you have got both Namora and Venus as members of the team. National slash All American slash DC Comics didn't really have a whole lot of female superheroes in the Golden Age. Now, they have the rights to a lot of female superheroes from the Golden Age, but most of them are characters from other companies like Phantom Lady that they, they bought up uh, and now can retroactively use. But at the time, um, the Justice Society had, for example, Wonder Woman joined in 1941, and then it was 1948, I think, when the Black Canary joined, and then that was it. So far as female members of the JSA, Hawk Girl uh, didn't even get a full membership, despite the fact that Hawkman was a founding member. So apparently he didn't uh, he didn't pull any uh, pull any strings or put in a good word for her. Uh, DC did have Liberty Bell that we've talked about once before, and a character called Red Tornado, uh, who was kind of played. Uh, mostly for laughs. Uh, there would later be a totally unrelated Red Tornado character, nothing like this one at all. Well, let's take a look at some of the other companies. And this is just a smattering, just a smattering of the 100 to 150 or more characters we could look at. And I'm not even going to take the time to tell you about each one. Um, you can... Uh, uh, take you know take a take a moment to peruse them and you can find out stuff about them easily. Well, some of them not so easily online. 
but I will specifically mention Nelvana of the Northern Lights because that character is pretty significant on several different levels. Uh, Alana, uh, Alana North, alias Nelvana of the Northern Lights, was a character that was put out by Hilboro Studios in Canada that made Nelvana the first Canadian superhero and actually the first Canadian comic book character. Also, the fact that she was Inuit or Eskimo makes Nelvana the first female superhero, well, the first non-Caucasian female superhero. So, uh, significant there for several reasons. Wildfire on the lower right ca caused a bit of a sensation um, in 1941 for her very, very skimpy out outfit. Um, it would have been considered skimpy for a swim outfit even at that time. Then let's take a look at some uh, some others. Now I like some of these names like Lady Satan and Lady Fair Play. Who could resist that? Uh, another significant, well not a character but a group of characters, the Girl Commandos put out by Harvey Comics in 1942. You'll notice uh, one significant thing about this, other than the fact that it's a group of uh, um, girl commandos led by Pat Parker, who was initially referred to as War Nurse. Um, they have a, uh, uh, an Asian member, a Chinese member, with Mei Ling. Also significant, this, uh, this uh, comic was done by Barbara Hall. So it's an all-girl group all woman group, despite the title, that's, uh, that's done by a, a female artist. And when Barbara Hall left the book, she was replaced by another woman, Jill Elgin. Okay, uh, quite a few uh, of these uh, um, come from companies that we haven't talked about at all because they're such small companies. Um, this leads us into another whole kind of subgenre. And that is the genre known as the Jungle Girl. Will Eisner and Jerry Iger got the ball rolling with this one early on in the history of comics in 1937 with Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Now, on the one hand, this is sort of like a female version of the Tarzan story. There were a lot of Tarzan knockoffs and imitators. But oddly enough, I'm just guessing here, but it seems as though there were easily maybe three times as many, at least twice as many, jungle girls as there were Caucasian jungle men uh, who were imitators of Tarzan. And Sheena was extraordinarily popular and lasted for many, many years and really kind of, uh, kind of opened the doorway for sort of a, a sub-genre cottage industry. These are just a few examples of the jungle girls that would show up in the 1940s and into the 1950s. You had Camilla and Lorna. Not real uh, original names there, although you also had Marga and Rula and, and others. It's hard to beat the name Jung Gal. Uh, and by the way, I don't have a cover uh, as a picture uh, for Jung Gal because she didn't have the cover story. In the, uh, I think it was uh, Thrilling where the, uh, uh, was the title where she appeared. But even the splash pages that, uh, that she had, I couldn't find any that weren't a f too offensive for me to want to show so far as their horribly stereotypical portrayal of the African people. Uh, and I'm talking about in comparison to all the other books. Uh, it was just as about as horrible as you could imagine. Anyway, you had uh, uh, Princess Pantha over in Thrilling Comics and Tiger Girl. 
uh, and fight. And Neoka the Jungle Girl, who's a little different from these others in that she's not a girl who was raised in the jungle by animals like these others. She's a girl who just kind of likes being in the jungle. So she frequently wears European-style clothing. Uh, all of it summed up well uh, by this title, White Princess of the Jungle, because that's what all these characters basically are, right? Now, on the one hand, it seems kind of disingenuous to, um, to reflect and think, wow, why were there so many more half-naked girls in the jungle in comic books than there were half-naked guys uh, when you realize that they're trying to sell comic books and that their target audience is adolescent males. That probably had a whole lot to do with it. Um, but beyond that, this is a kind of a kind of a complex sort of thing in some ways because these female characters, most of them, um, are not sidekicks to a jungle guy. They're the main star. And they take things in hand and they are in control. Um, so they are kind of empowered, but at the same time, you know, they're in these very skimpy outfits. They're obviously hypersexualized, very unrealistic. Plus the fact that, I mean, you know, how many white women are ruling Africa at any one given time in the 1940s, right? Um, just the fact that you've got someone like Tarzan or any of the imitators, male or female, uh, that is the lord or lady of the jungle in sub-Saharan Africa is just right away implicit racism right there. Um, you've got, uh, you know, a, a white person like Tarzan because of his noble ancestry, right? He is, uh, he's really Lord Greystoke. Why, even if he wasn't a lord, just by dint of his, his superior genetics, it seems, he could be raised by animals and still be a whole lot more competent and effective than a thousand black guys living near him. And when you factor in that you've got these white women who are frequently, repeatedly, really, referred to as savage, right? So that's kind of a bit of a male power fantasy right there to be dominated by a savage female. William Moulton Marston talked about that, but also in a more sexist manner than, than Marston's approach to have the fantasy of being the one to tame this, this savage woman of, uh, of the, uh, the, the primitive sort of uh, uh, primordial jungle right, who is in control of all these male black bodies, but is not uh, shared with them in a sexual way. Uh, there's just, there's just multiple generations of uh, slave-holding angst tied up in all of that in so many different ways. Um, there's one other example from the time period that I want to mention that's really different. Fantoma, mystery woman of the jungle. She's a jungle girl, and she's a superhero. And she's a weird monster because she can transform into this, like, bulked-up, muscular, skull-faced uh, creature. Um, that's just the sort of thing you didn't find anywhere else. And you didn't even find it there for long in jungle comics because... Uh, she came out in 1940, and she was around for a long time. But after the first few years, they dropped the whole skull face thing and just had her be a very attractive, barely dressed blonde woman in the jungle. Well, in some ways, this type of adolescent male power fantasy is timeless, at least in our culture, as reflected by the fact that after these things kind of subsided in the late 50s, they briefly came back around in the 70s. 1972, Marvel introduced Shanna the She-Devil, whose own title didn't last long, uh, but she did become a supporting character uh, in Kazar, who was one of the male Tarzan ripoffs, so she became sort of his sidekick. And then Rima 
The Jungle Girl in D.C. 1974. Also didn't last very long. Showed up every once in a while. Actually, she showed up in animation on the Super Friends in the late 70s. Also in the late 70s from Hanna-Barbera, the animated cartoon Janna of the Jungle, which lasted, I think, a couple of seasons. And again, more recently, from Dynamite Comics. And Dynamite, Dynamite does a lot of throwbacks. Um, they've done, uh, well, they did that uh, Lone Ranger meets the Green Hornet thing. They do Zorro, um, various other things based on older properties, kind of like a modernized nostalgia. Uh, and 2007, uh, Frank Cho uh, doing the, uh, the artistic honors. They introduced a jungle girl named Jana. So kind of loosely, sort of tangentially based on the uh, Hanna-Barbera animated character who had a couple of different uh, miniseries. And as you can see, uh, by 2007, they were able to, uh, without the Comics Code Authority around, to, to dampen the party uh, for them. They were able to um, be even, even more kind of sensationalistic. So someone could write a dissertation, I think, or write a whole book just on the phenomenon of the comic book Jungle Girl and all the different layers attached to that. 